You know, people say you go to prison because you don't follow the rules. It's not true. You go to prison because you do follow the rules. Mm -hmm. The real rules that tell men how they're supposed to be. It's just some of us get criminalized for it and some of us become president for it. Can you start by just talking about how you feel right now? These past few days have been some of the best days I've ever lived. The statewide abolitionist movement in California and in Los Angeles literally won every campaign that we fought for. My best friend's sentence getting commuted and going from having 40 to life to immediately available to see the parole board. A lot of years of work have paid off in the past few days mm -hmm. and it's been amazing. So can you talk about what your style says about you? I've always wanted to express my politics through how I dress. And that doesn't mean I have to wear a shirt with a political message on it. I'm actually really not into that. I more so want the style of the clothing to say something about how I see the world. And I think by wearing bright colors and prints and Hello Kitty and things that just make me, like I literally have like a physiological experience of happiness when I see them. I'm telling the world that patriarchy is bullshit. I was raised and, and very much bought into the toxic masculine culture of our country and like our world, that boys aren't supposed to be happy <laughs> or have emotions at all. There were moments where I was more bold and challenged that. And there was moments when I completely pledged my allegiance to that. And from like the first day of middle school, when I was wearing like bright colors and clothes with like lizards on them, to like winter break, my whole style changed. By winter break, I was wearing like super big jeans and like big white t-shirts and I was only wearing like white and gray. I remember when I was officially going to get put on my hood, my homegirl was like, why are you doing this? Like everybody already loves you for who you are. And I responded to her, I said, I want them to respect me as a man. And I felt like I had to gangbang and risk my life on a daily basis to be a quote unquote real man. Can you talk about uh, assumptions that people make about you based on your appearance? People make thousands of assumptions of me based on, on my appearance. You know, when I walk down the street, white people cross the street. Around the time I was like 10 years old, I like broke five feet and everybody was afraid of me all of a sudden. I would just feel sad. I would just be like, dang, I don't even, I ain't gonna hurt you. And then I got to a point where I was like, yes, I will hurt you. I think when you grow up in a body similar to mine in this country, you are taught that you are society's enemy. And at first I felt really bad and I wanted to show society how nice I am. And eventually I was like, okay, cool. You're my enemy too then, fuck you. And that was what gangbanging looked like for me from 16 to 22. I started getting in trouble with the law when I was 11. The first time I was arrested was for playing too rough on the schoolyard. And then again, when I was 13 for leaving school early, I've been arrested for being late to class. I was arrested and choke slammed for talking during an assembly. So my dad, he saw it as I was just the problem. And my dad kicked me out of the house when I was 16. And that's how I ended up in the streets. When I was 18, I went to jail for something I didn't do. I was like literally just like driving down the street, pulled over, told that I matched the description for a robbery. I went to jail for like six days, I think. And then the DA rejected the case. But after being in jail, I was like, oh shit, I never want to go there again. Then I started working for the county of LA as a teacher's assistant for preschoolers. The county cut its budget. So I showed up to work one day and my, my classroom was closed and I didn't have a job. And the way I felt was I had just finally got a car, got my first apartment and I didn't want to be sleeping in cars again. And I hit up the homie who really was like a, a drug dude. I let him know what happened. I figured he would give me some drugs to sell or something. And he was like, yo, the homies just hit a pharmacy for like $40,000. I said, let's go right now. We did not get $40,000, we got $1,500. And after splitting it up, I still couldn't pay my rent. And we did it a couple more times. On the very last time we left and there was like a helicopter following us, but didn't have its lights on and they were getting all scared. And you know, I was hella arrogant or whatever. So I was like, well, give me the money and I'll just walk home since y'all scared. And I got out the car and I was walking and this Mustang pulled up on me. And these two dudes jumped out in plain clothes with bulletproof vests and big ass guns. And they told me to put my hands on my head. They ran up and they hit me with a gun and I just knocked out. They just beat the shit out of me and should have killed your black ass. And they tried to give me 150 years to life. My community, the organizing community that I grew up with raised $10,000 so I can get a private attorney. And I fought the case for a year in the LA County jail. And I ended up getting 10 years and two strikes and going to prison.
Like when you were getting arrested, like you remember just your feelings at that time? Yeah, when I got arrested, it was the most scared I've ever been in my life. Because here's the thing, if I just got prison time for what I did, I would have done between two and six years in prison. And I remember the first time I went to court and they offered us a deal, my first deal was nine years. And that's when I realized like, oh, this is my new reality now. When I came back from court that day, I just went, I got in my bed, put my blanket over my face and just cried. Like, this is where I'm going to be. I was scared of not being able to be the person who I wanted to be. Which is? not the character uh, that I was playing. And once I was fighting that case, I was like, oh, I might have missed my chance to live my destiny. And that's what hurt the most. If I were to be involved in any violence, then I'll get a third strike and I'll get life in prison. I figured I'm gonna have to be involved with something at some point and I'm gonna get struck out and lose my life. Or if I choose not to be involved, then I will get attacked for not being involved and I can still lose my life in a different, like be killed. So it was like a life or death situation. So the idea that I wouldn't play the role felt to me like I'd be choosing death. I don't think I would have made a choice to be my authentic self if I didn't have so many people who showed me that that was okay and that that was good enough. And that's what people don't understand. People see incarcerated people with gang tattoos all over their face and like doing wild ass shit, stabbing people. And they're like, these people are monsters. But it's like, no, they're just fighting for the only love they get. And the only love they get is the pat on the back for stabbing a quote unquote enemy. But if you give them love for something else, they will go for that too. And I was blessed enough to get love for being authentic rather than being violent. Enough to even make the very scary and potentially dangerous choice of choosing myself over patriarchal prison culture. I remember the first time I said something to someone about misogyny, I was so fucking scared. I was physically shaking. I was in the cell with my celly at the time and he was like telling a story. And every time he referred to a woman in the story, he referred to her as the B word. And I just asked him like, do you only refer to women as the B word? And I was so wow. shook. You know, I'm from the Valley in LA and he's from South Central. And he was just like, man, shut your old Valley square ass up. Like trying to tell me how to talk. Like what the fuck? And that was it though. He didn't punch me in the face. And I was like, oh, okay. And I just slowly pushed myself to do more and more. And then eventually started Success Stories where we did that work as like an organization, as a program where we do toxic masculinity workshops with incarcerated young men. And then a couple months into running success stories and feeling more like authentic, even within prison, I remember there was another homie of ours. He also had three strikes. Me and Charles were sitting in class and we heard some racial epithets being thrown back and forth in the room next door, which is like a big deal in prison because California general population prisons are segregated by race. Black folks and Asian folks are on one side and Latinx folks and white folks are on the other side. And literally the buildings are, are designed in such a way so that there's two like sides of the building. We started hearing some racial stuff going back and forth. So me and Charles, our ears perk up because we're like, oh shit, it's about to be a race riot. And it turns out that some of our homies were about to jump this teacher, that apparently this teacher had said something anti-black. So I'm talking to my homie and I'm like, bro, you got two strikes. You realize if you jump a teacher, you're gonna get life. And he was like, so? I'll fucking die for this shit, I don't give a fuck. And I was like, er, not me. He was like, so you're saying you wouldn't help me? I was like, absolutely not. I was like, you choose to jump a teacher and throw your life away, can't help you, bro. And he went and like told all my homies about it. So now my homies were like politicking on me. Like they're about to jump me because I said that I wouldn't participate in this, right? And that's actually just sad to me because <laughs> we have a much bigger problem here. We're, we're all a bunch of black people in prison. And I just chose like, I'm just not gonna play this game no more. So if y'all gonna jump me and I'm gonna get life in prison, I'd rather get life in prison for fighting for what I believe in than get life in prison for jumping some teacher because I'm afraid of what y'all think of me. And the change of events that only God can write, they all respected it. After doing success stories for a while, we are like, yo, this system is still patriarchal as well. <laughs> and I told my partner at the time, her background was in state policy. She said, you should write a bill about it. And me and Charles were like, okay, we've never written a bill before. At this point, we're 22 year old kids in prison. We went to the law library, we did the research, we sent it to her, she put it in like the bill format and she got it introduced. And it made it so that you can earn time off your sentence by going to rehabilitative programs like success stories. And the governor's office hit up our author, the assembly person who introduced it, and he added that language into what ultimately became Prop 57. And we started organizing people in prison, people who used to be in prison, 
people with family members in prison, in the visiting room. And you know, we were just part of the huge California movement to pass Prop 57 and it passed. I was able to earn two years off my sentence because of the programs that I went through. So you could have still been right now as we speak there. I would have got out March 30th, 2020. Interestingly enough, my dad passed away on March 23rd, 2020. Oh so if we didn't change that you law, would have, you would then have been there. I wouldn't have had that year and a half with my dad. How do you feel like you tended to your mental health or did you when you were in prison? The hardest thing about prison for me was the constant being treated as less than a human being. Like there was one time when we were driving to another prison, they just left us in the holding tank. So there's like 20 of us and the floor was wet. It was like a gross public bathroom. One of the older dudes we were with was like, can y'all give us some sheets? And there is a, a incarcerated person worker rolling a dirty laundry bin full of dirty sheets. And the cop was like, give them some of those sheets. And we had like nasty, like orange stain, like throw up sheets. But those aren't the moments that like hurt the most. The moments that hurt the most that fucked up my mental health were like the small things of like, I had a midterm and I had to get my college books from under my door. In order to get to the building, you know, I don't have fucking keys. And there's a cop right there, like on the other side of the door. And I knocked on the door and he like looked at me and just continued his conversation for 20 minutes. I just stood there. It was just the way that it didn't even occur to him to open the door. I didn't even exist. Like that moment over and over and over. What that does to you is you start to feel like you do not deserve anything. Within romantic relationships, the idea of me asking for what I wanted was off the table because who am I? It took me years of therapy since getting out and coaching and love from my community to see myself as a worthwhile person. That has been the hardest hit to my mental health, for sure. Can you talk about the day that you got out of prison? Oh, I was so scared. When we first got in the car and we were driving home, my partner at the time, she was like, you wanna stop by the store and like get something to eat? And I was like, no, no, don't stop. I was afraid they would come back and get me. We finally did like stop and go in a store. I remember walking in and just walking like, so aware of everybody and thinking that everybody knew that I was just in prison somehow. And like getting my little spicy mangoes and the guy being like, have a nice day. And me being like, you have a nice day. Cause I too am having a nice day and we're just two regular people having nice days. I remember the next day I went to like go jogging and I was staying on the small streets and I was staying off Western at the time. And I remember stopping like when I saw Western Boulevard and just like being like, I can't go out there. And I just started crying. I was just, I just, I don't know what I was afraid of. It was just, I just felt like if I was out there, everybody would know that I didn't belong here and that I actually belonged in prison. Yeah. Building trust with myself has been the hardest thing for me to do internally since getting out of prison. After years of just being told that you're the worst and not just in prison, but like before that, just being treated like the enemy from the time you were a child, you believe that you are the enemy, you know? And that has been really hard. Do you feel like worthy and deserving of things now? I fight too. I've learned in relationships to ask for what I want. And it's even okay if the other person says no, it doesn't mean I don't deserve it, it just means it's not gonna come from them. I still feel the fear though, when I'm going to ask for the thing that I want. And I've learned that that's just part of it and that that's okay. When was the last time you cried? Yesterday? Maybe the day before that? Why? Because my best friend got a sentence commuted. I don't know if it was only a happy cry though. It was also just the, a release cry of every day 24 seven, mm -hmm. knowing that all the people I love are still being treated the ways that I've described today. What's your biggest hope? Um, my biggest hope in life is that we can make it so that like vengeful, violent, patriarchal culture is no longer like the accepted norm. I don't think of it like a hope because we fight for that shit every day. Like the idea that I robbed these stores, which is terrible, and that the response was, they're gonna beat the shit out of me and try to hold me against my will at gunpoint away from my family for 150 years. Like, what does that have to do with that? And the way that people, like that is assumed and that is normal and people are like, yeah, that is what we wanna change. I mean, we harmed and traumatized so many people, not physically harmed, but mentally, emotionally, like traumatized so many people in those robberies. But I do often think about the security guard who I myself made lay on his stomach at gunpoint while my friend took the registers and just how he like begged me not to hurt him. And hmm. yeah, that's another big,
part of the reason why I do the work that I do because I'm just trying to help build a world where shit like that doesn't happen. Pass. Okay, so last question. Why in your body, in your skin, in your journey, why is it a good place to be? Oh, I am so grateful to be born me. When I was in jail, I remember thinking, damn, why couldn't I have been born someone else? Because I felt trapped. Why wasn't I born a bird? Like, their lives are so simple. And they can fly in and out of the jail whenever they want. But after I had found my authenticity and like my bag, I was like, I am grateful that God put my soul in my body and I get to have this experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to be me. I, I really wouldn't want to be anyone else. How do you feel right now? I'm like very aware of the fact that I don't have clothes on, but I'm trying to seem like I'm not. <laughs> but besides that, I feel good. Hi, we're Elisa and Lily, the mother and daughter creators of Style Like You. You can get the extended version of this interview in the What's Underneath podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you were inspired by Richie's story, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel over here. And don't forget to click the bell so each Thursday you're reminded of when we've dropped a new episode. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts to all of our members who continually support our growth. You can join them by heading over to patreon.com slash style like you.